Welcome everybody, and uh, well, I'm exciting to be here, and what an exciting time to be alive. Um, <laughs> so much change, so much great change, so much innovation, all the things that we heard about in previous talks, digitalization. Um, but at the forefront, I think one of the most exciting advancements is this distributed ledger technology. Because for the first time, in the history of mankind, do we have the technology at our fingertips to build structures, organizations that are fully decentralized, totally transparent, and incentivize its users to behave in a way that benefits the entire community and therefore have a real chance to change the way that societies work and have a real chance to eradicate global financial imbalances. But before I get carried away, uh, let me uh, introduce myself. I'm Michael Geik, I'm 34 years old. I uh, am a mathematician. I worked for JP Morgan trading interest rate derivatives for six years. But did lots of other things like opening up frozen yogurt stores in Berlin, or I um, led teams of data scientists for Zalando in Berlin as well, and also for Next in Cologne. But most excitingly, I started mining bitcoins in 2013 um, in the basement, and uh, lined up lots of rigs that heated up the room so much that we didn't need heating in the flat above. Um, but that was the old days, since then the technology has come a long way. Um, and I'm here, uh, now CEO of Advanced Blockchain AG, and we are a listed company on the Düsseldorf Stock Exchange. And our um, current and most exciting new project is called Peak, with a Q. I would love to talk to you about Peak only, but unfortunately I can't really talk about this yet because our public announcement will only be next week on the 17th of November in Berlin. If you want to uh, know more about this, then please contact me and uh, um, show up in Berlin. So, today I'm here to talk about... Ah, oh, this doesn't work. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll continue anyway. So today yeah, I'm, talk, I'm here to talk about distributed ledger technology in general. So who, is, who here in this room has heard about blockchain before? Wow, I would say this is about uh, 80%. It's not a huge sample, but uh, that's great. Two years ago that was about 10% at most. And who has heard about distributed ledger technology? Do you have a few less? Who has heard about... Ethereum, uh, probably still 50%. And who's heard about the Tangle? Yeah, not bad, bad. two people. Um, and I, I will explain all of these in a minute. <laughs> but to understand where, where we've come from, when we say blockchain was just the beginning, we have to go way back to 1837 to Charles Pages, when he discovered that swe sweeping a wire spiral through a current causes different sounding vibrations. And everything that was discovered afterwards was built on this discovery until we arrived at the internet. And there would be no blockchain without the internet, and no distributed ledger technology without the internet. So what is distributed ledger technology. Well, DLT is really just a super title for technologies like blockchain or the Tangle. In a nutshell, it really is just a piece of software that I can use, that you can use, that uses a consensus algorithm to allow us to agree, to reach consensus on certain data that we share. 
It's as simple as that. It just allows us to be certain that the data that we share is not corrupted, but is in fact the correct data. Such a simple idea, but so difficult to achieve. So there's no central organization that tells us this data is the correct data. No, we do this ourselves, or it's, it's done via this consensus algorithm. And a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin really is just the simplest application of this technology. I like to use the analogy um, to the internet, where people in the 90s became aware of the internet and how great it was by email. And said, wow, okay, I don't have to send a letter around the globe, I can actually use email, which takes only split seconds and it doesn't cost me anything, that's great. But it's only the simplest application of this technology. Then people wanted to have other features. They wanted to use bold um, letters. They wanted to underwrite. And said, OK, we build these features in. Then people wanted other features. And they said, hey, we come up with JavaScript so people can write their own features. And by enabling them to create their own features, the internet, as we know it today, has been built. Nobody could have dreamt of in the 90s what the internet would look like today and what it, what it enabled people to do. But by allowing people to build their own features, um, this great innovation came about. And this is exactly what Ethereum has been trying to do, to create a programming language which allows people to build their own features on the blockchain which means to build decentralized applications. So you could build smart contracts, where you don't need a whole infrastructure of lawyers enforcing a contract that I have with you, but it's, it's already encoded in the algorithm. Or you could build an Uber company where the cars own themselves and decide themselves when to buy more cars and to grow. Or you could build a decentralized Facebook or WhatsApp that doesn't belong to anyone, belongs only to the users. Another great concept is something called proof of publication, where the coin is created by an author publishing content. And if it's useful content, then you get, he gets credits. And even as a reader, if you upvote this content, and other readers agree with you, you also get credits. So you see, for the first time, we can build an environment where the contribution of real value to the system can be expressed as a digital good that exists solely for this purpose. And in a similar way, you could be rewarded for removing trolls of Facebook. And how cool would it be to make a living of that, doing that all day? And And this is a much more powerful form of regulation. It's a form of regulation that can actually work because it allows us to incentivize people to behave in a certain way. It will align the, the individual behavior with the desired outcomes, in this case for better social conversation. And people behave well not because we tell them to, but because the incentives to do so are overwhelming. And the disincentives to behave badly are also overwhelming. That's why these consensus algorithms are so powerful. So here's some facts. The global debt in fiat currency has reached $12 trillion. That is a huge sum of money that will just keep growing because there's no other way around it. Now, debt in cryptocurrencies doesn't really exist because it's not a system based on debt. It's a system based on ownership. The rate at which Bitcoin doubles is 12 every 12 months, and the rate at which Google Trend searches doubles even quicker is every 7 months. And 
As of today, or September, there were almost 2,000 people working full-time in the crypto space. <laughs> now, I say there are some flaws with the blockchain. Like the title says, suggests, blockchain is just the beginning, what is the future? I want to uh, start talking about the problems of blockchain. And to do that, we need to understand blockchain a little bit better or take a closer look. So how does blockchain typically work? So if A sends, wants to send some value to B, or a data package, or whatever kind of value, a, this, this transaction is broadcast to the network, among loads of other transactions. Miners then come along, take all of these transactions and bundle them into a block. To do that, they have to do work, something called proof of work. And then one miner finds this block and then broadcasts this block to the network. Via this consensus algorithm all, the network then agrees, yes, this is a correct block that works. And, and, and the block is validated and then added to previous blocks forming this chain. Once this validation happens, then the, the value really transfers from A to B. So it's a simple idea. What is the problem with it? The problem is scalability. So right now, Visa and MasterCard can do 55,000 transactions a second. Bitcoin can, up to now, only do 2.6 thousand a second. So why, why is this scalability issue there? It is because the blocks have limits. You can't just cram as many transactions in there as you want. Uh, why is this upper limit there? Because of spamming attacks. If there was no upper limit, people could just spam the system, slowing it right down. And this causes a huge problem. I mean, the, right now, the, this limit has been, has been reached, and, and so a new, an upgrade comes out, and so on and so on, but there are no real solutions on the horizon that will solve this, this problem uh, for all. And what happens is when these block sizes are reached, transaction fees increase. And this is also a big problem for micropayments or other applications where this technology wants to go. It's also not quantum proof. I know quantum computers are a long time away, but if they come, they pose a real threat to the system. And we can, you need it to have an internet connection to use this technology too. I'm not saying that these problems cannot be solved. As a matter of fact, I think they will be solved. But doing so involves a lengthy process of miners having to agree with core developers, having to agree with the community, with, its, with the users, to develop it further. But luckily today, there is a technology out there that does already solve all these issues. And this is called the Tangle. Now the Tangle technology is something that doesn't involve a blockchain. It uses a mathematical concept called a directed acyclic graph, which looks a lot more like a network or like a tree. And where Minus the, the validation work in the blockchain, here, you as a user do the validation work. So there are no more blocks, there are just single transactions, and if you do a transaction in the network, you automatically validate two previous transactions. And this simple fact means the more people use the Tangle network, the faster it becomes. And this is a great, a great, great innovation because it means growing people are not going to slow it down. 
a growing community will actually increase its speed and it's going to grow exponentially. It also means that there are no fees which make it uh, applicable to a, a huge spectrum of, um, um, of use cases that we probably haven't even dreamt up yet, similar to the internet in the 90s. But in, this is so relevant in the internet of things, where you, have, where you don't need 55,000 transactions a second, but you need a million transactions a second globally, when you have all these smart machines running around, communicating with each other, and want to share data packets with each other, and want to make sure that they're not corrupt. Then you do need a network like that that can facilitate these kind of transactions. Zero fees, you don't need to be online. We could all be cut off from the internet, but could still use um, the network and validate each other's transactions, and only one of us becomes online again, and then you're connected to the network again. It works. There's no mining, which means even a greater degree of decentralization. And you could say, some people say, okay, these, this, this market is so overblown and it's, 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 it's in a bubble state and, um, um, and it's all going to crash. Yes, maybe, I don't know. But if you look at these numbers here, the crypto market, if you look at some capitalizations, the crypto market is only 0.2% of the global stock market. That's really negligible. That's a tiny percentage. Even though $2 billion have flown into the cryptocurrency um, space, into initial coin offerings, so new coins that were created, this year alone, and for the first time this number was bigger than the entire venture capital market. And that, how ironic is that? That the very first market that got disrupted by this technology was the venture capital market itself. But that's real disruption. You just don't know where it's going to hit first. <coughs> and do I think... Um, so what, why do you think so much money went into this? Yeah, well, of course, because people see how much value is created. They all want to have a piece of the pie. But this technology is also so great. If you invest in a startup, you have to wait five years, ten years be before you can uh, exit again. If you invest in, a, in an initial coin offering, you buy this digital good, and the minute you buy it, you can trade it, you can send it, you can, you can do whatever you want with it. And do I think that stock market companies are going to use this technology to raise money in the future? Yes. I think this will definitely happen at some point. Because it's so cheap and so easy. But we still haven't reached mass adoption yet. Um, it's still difficult for someone who's not really in, in, in the crypto space, who's not really a techie, to use this technology. So usability will still need a lot of improvement before, before anyone on the street can use it. So what's it going to take to bring this technology to the masses? Well, we've seen the problem, I think, the biggest, the key fact that we need is scalability. So when Bitcoin is nine years old this week, the Tangle is only nine months old. So there's a lot of infrastructure that still needs to be built on the Tangle. And Is this going to happen? Yes, I know it is. And I can only say, be patient. It's coming, and we're working on it. Thank you.